Hello and welcome to the Dice Tower. I'm Wendy Yee. I'm Chris Yee. And today we're going to be reviewing a pile of small box games. So we've done a pile of games before. We did the, the Pandemic series. This one's different because we're reviewing these games. We're not looking at an older uh, series of games, but we thought this would be a nice way to discuss all of these ones. Sure, here. these are all small box games, and because they're so small, they probably aren't going to make it into a full review by themselves. So this is just a great way to highlight these and kind of have that, they can each have their little moment. And some of these aren't very good, actually, as you will see. So this is not like a pile of, of, of crummy games and stuff. Um, let's just go ahead and get this pile started. All right, first up, we have Fish and Flip. It sounds like a dish. Like, I feel like I could go to a restaurant and I could get a Fish and Flip. Filet and deep fry this for mm -hmm. me. I am an American. So this is a almost bejeweled style game in the sense that you are trying to, it's a cooperative game, you're trying to play some cards, and you're trying to get the, the sea creatures that you've chosen to be the same direction as well as the same type next to each other. If there's ever a set of two or more that are meeting those requirements, then you can remove them and you eventually add more fish in each round and they kind of fall down. So it, def it definitely reminds me of like, hey, line up some bejeweled rows, have them disappear, and you want to, you know, keep them from getting up too high. It's like Tetris. It's the Tetris, Tetris end Tetris Bejeweled, game. yeah. yeah. Te te tetra Jeweled. Tetra Jeweled. Yeah. Hashtag Tetra Jeweled. Revenge of the Tetra Jewel. This game is... It's, it's meh. It's meh. I'm giving this a four because I think that there's barely a game there. I... It's fiddly compared to an app that does it automatically. And why do I play those apps? I play those apps because I just have some spare time where I want to do something mindless. And so going out of my way to pull out four out of the eight possible different sea creature types and then laying them and then having them eventually fall down and resetting. And it's just like, why? Why all that much work for something that I can do that's way more interesting on a phone? My favorite part of the game was the octopus. And that's literally it. Like, I really like the that's octopus. Cute. I don't remember what it was special about it, but I was like, that's a cool octopus. Yeah, yeah, and that's unfortunate when that's my main takeaway from a game. Very simple, sure. dead simple little play an action card, switch, swap things, flip flop or whatever. But like you said, the fact that you also have to go through setup for it uh, made it not quite worth it for me and, and my playtime. Would you give it? Uh, oh, yes. I, I also would give it a four. So that's fiction flip. Next up on the pile here is Monster Inn. This is from Pegasus Spiel. This is a little bit of a for sale type of an auction game mm -hmm. where you have two different types of currencies. You have a lineup of monsters equal to the number of players. You're auctioning. You're trying to stay in longer. Once you bow out, you take all the coins that are in the middle of the table and you take the worst card there and put it in front of you. And then the remaining players will go through an auction. And you continue to do that until all the cards in the middle have been taken. You line up four new cards or cards equal to the number of players. And you go through that again. This is a, you know, it's a simple auction format. Like I said, it reminds me of the game For Sale. But unfortunately, this is just less clean than For Sale. It is. I feel like there's a lot of luck involved. Whereas For Sale, you're bidding against these numbers specifically. Whereas in this game, you have to perfectly align the proper level monsters with the proper level humans so that they can fight each other. But the randomness of how that comes out is just random. Like, I could have a really strong monster and I could get a dinky little human that goes under him. And then the very next round, I could have this huge monster that I get, or huge human I get stuck with. Um, and then I don't have a big monster to fight him. It leads to some choices, which is not bad. Oh, I have to bow out early this round. Uh, and I got a huge powerful human, which I know, okay, next round then, I want to get something that I'll try to protect or you know, not get something that will just get crushed, or maybe just be like, eh, whatever, I'll just yeah. get one that can be easily crushed. I like the, the, your favorite part, I think, was being able to switch between the two types of currencies. Yes. If yeah. there's three coins in the middle, I could be like, ah, five rubies instead, take your coins out of here. It's interesting because I feel like you have a little bit more chance to read if you're later on in the bid. So yeah. you're like, if I change things up, I know that Chris doesn't have any rubies. So if I switch it to rubies, now suddenly I have way more strength than he does. Yeah, there's some very interesting ideas in here. I like a lot of what's happening. However, at the same time, the game does fall flat for me. It has a few more rules and unfortunately lives in the shadow of a game that I consider to be nearly a perfect game. So what would you give it score-wise? I'm, I'm giving it a five because as much as I like the ideas and what's going on in here, the amount of luck and the amount of a little bit of fiddliness prevent it from, from this one being something I want to pull out again. 
I'm also giving it a five. I just have no interest in it. Um, like you said, there's a better game that uses some of these mechanisms, and those are the mechanisms that I'm the most okay with. Whereas the extra stuff that they put in where monsters have to fight monster or humans and stuff, that all just was like meh to me. Yeah, there you go. That's Monster Written. Next up is Regroup Chicken Army. <laughs> it has some really cute artwork. Look at these like swords on these dinky little weird chickens with their heads all sideways. I love this artwork. This is from the same company that did Dodo's Riding Dinos, and mm -hmm. it shows. It's very adorable, very precious looking. Best part of the game. Uh, so this is a game where you have square cards, and they are fit into little quadrants, or they're divided into little quadrants. And on your turn, you have to either grab one from the lineup or one from the top of the deck, based on how many coins are showing on front of you. Depends on how many options you have really. Um, but essentially what you're doing is you're laying one corner of a card on top of another card, at least minimum, and then you are trying to balance how many swords versus shields you have versus magic power versus magic shields, and you're essentially like fighting the people across the table from you. Uh, and it's an interesting game in that we've been seeing, in fact we're going to cover another one of these games where there's cards divided into into quadrants, quadrants and where you, you have cover to cover stuff up. yeah yeah like multiple games like this have come out at the same time it's one of those deep impact armageddon type things yeah i know i'll play to chomp i know we've got this next one coming up here yeah trailblazers did a little bit of that it wasn't square cards but right with overland yeah. cards and stuff mm -hmm. and i like that i like that mechanism quite a bit because you're sacrificing something in order to get more stuff which is neat this one's funny because it's combative mm -hmm. but it doesn't feel mean right yeah it you at the end of each round, everybody attacks everybody. So it's not like I'm I'm isolating, I'm trying to lay out my thing just to mess up Wendy. Boom, shakalaka. Well, right? you are in a two-player game. Well, that's you're true. You're totally trying to mess up Wendy. But you're also just trying to build your best. You're just trying to do your best. Yeah, you're just trying to build a cool thing, and you are looking at other people and being like, hey, he doesn't have a lot of magical shield, so if I build up my magic and I make it bigger, that'd be awesome. There's some games where there's that confrontation and it feels mean, and this one to me doesn't. It just kind yeah. of feels like a form of getting victory points. Uh, but I, I gotta say, I'm charmed by it. I know the goofy chicken art, the chicken holding the sword, really helps sell the game. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think the art is the best part for me. Um, I think it's adorable, but am I ever gonna pick it up again? I don't think so. You don't think so, so this is gonna be this is gonna be a six. I think if someone asked me, and they're like, "Oh, do you want to play Chicken Army? It's so cool!" Like if they're went over by the art enough that they want to play it, I'd play it because I think that it is a totally fine game. Um, but the actual mechanisms behind it are just fine. See, and for me, it's a seven because I find it to be quick enough, uh, just such a fast-paced game. Yeah, and I am really charmed by it. The the I might be a little bit more charmed by the art than I should be, but I think it sets the tone of what type of game this is. Quick, goofy, silly. Is it highly strategic? Not really. There is a little variant in there where uh, you have a health card, which is a little bit of an annoying way to track your health. You have to kind of move a card mm -hmm. behind another one. But if you flip over to the other side, you, uh, meaning that you're at half damage, you get a special extra little boost. And I would always play with that rule. Yeah. Because it's better to say, hey, you're beat up, you're doing worse, here's a little boon. I don't... It makes me think of that like adrenaline mechanism. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that this game doesn't take itself seriously and is good for what it's doing. I alluded to the fact that this is another one of these types of games. This alluded. one's called... Alluded. Alluded. I think we straight up said it. Okay. Well, this is Nimalia. This is from Le Boite Joux and Lucky Duck Games. Uh, and this is an animal-themed game where you have cards divided into quadrants and you overlap them over each other. Surprise! Y'all didn't see that coming. Right. This one does it differently though by the fact that the the background matters, the type of animal matters and stuff because there are five different types of scoring events that will happen in the game and there's a few different scoring conditions. So at the end of the first round, the first scoring condition will go off. At the end of the second round, two different scoring conditions will go off. At the end of the third round, two different two different different scoring it's like conditions. One go and off. two, then two and three, and then three and four, and then one and four. I'm charmed by this one as well, but it's also far more thinky and strategic than the the regroup chicken army. Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I enjoy so like the animals they play differently depending on who they are like the the cute little otters have to be by water so you have to connect them and just yeah everything works a little bit differently and i like that and i like that it's based on the scoring objectives that the the animals themselves mm -hmm. don't have extra fiddly rules you have to remember 
it's based on, hey, the scoring objectives there in the middle of the table say, uh, this game, otters next to waters, yeah. super matters. And then you switch it out and you play another time, and it's uh, that you don't want, uh, you have a different blue back condition. You need to make sure that penguins are adjacent to water. Something like that. Yeah. That's not a great example. I'm not giving the best. But I like that sometimes you want to cluster things together. Sometimes you want them far apart. Sometimes you want big groupings or multiple big groupings. Things like mm-hmm. things that just make the game very thinky, actually. I'm a sucker for puzzly games, and this fits that puzzly mindset for me of I want to maximize the objectives as early as I can. So if like one and two are firing off initially, like I want to make sure I maximize those, but I also want to look later and set up for later stuff. And I know, hey, at some point, two is not going to score again, but one is going to score again. So it's it, I enjoy that form of puzzle. It's a lot of fun for me. Um, I think just because there's so many other games that are like this, it didn't quite make a seven for me. This is going to be a 6.5 um, because there, there just are so many of these that have come out recently. And I'm like, they're all... They're all good to some extent, but what would make me pick this over anything else? That's interesting. Okay. I'm giving this a 7.5. I actually even like it a a smidge more than I like the Regroup Chicken Army. Mm -hmm. You're right that there are plenty of card games that do this. Overlap, you know, make groupings and stuff. Yeah. I am particularly sold, though, on that scoring. The fact that there are objectives that will come up early and later. And so you're thinking about how important that's going to be. So I'm giving a 7.5. It reminds me of Isle of Sky in the scoring mechanism, yeah. which is one of my favorite games. This is in my top 100 and everything. So, yeah, this one packs a lot of game into a small package. My only concern is sometimes you play it with people who really lock up with decisions. Sure. There's a lot of ways that you could lock up in this game for such a light, easygoing game. Mm-hmm. So that's my only concern, but otherwise, I really like it. 7.5 for me, for Nimalia. Next up, the second to last one is Bridge City Poker. This is a, it's like a mix between trick taking and card shedding where you are playing sets of hands. So you're playing a flush or a run or something like that or three of a kind. And the person who plays it, everyone has to follow like in a trick taking game by playing something that is similar or higher. So you have to match the type of hand, but then you have to play Uh, the same level cards are higher. And so um, it's interesting because there's also these other cards inside it that have like special abilities. So you can choose to play a hand, you can choose to play the special ability card, you can choose to discard the special ability card, or you can choose to do nothing and just draw extra. And if you, yeah, when you do nothing, that feels really bad because you have to draw two cards instead of one at the end of the hand. Because you're trying to get rid of everything. If you win the trick, you don't have to draw and you get to lead. So there's incentive to try to win the tricks and Mm -hmm. everything, especially because the the round ends when either one player sheds out their hand completely or you play through the deck of cards. Because unlike most trick-taking games, you're drawing cards throughout the game. Right. I think this does a a very interesting mix of, as you said, trick-taking because you play in tricks, right? You play once around the table, determine the winner, Mm -hmm. but you're also trying to shed out your hand because the hands will empty out at uneven tempo. And I feel like that makes us really unique. Yeah. It's just very interesting. The, the way that you're trying to make that balance of you want to leave a lot of good stuff in your hands. You can make different combinations because you don't know what other people are going to play, but you also want to use the benefits for the benefit power and there's just there's interesting stuff going on yeah this one looks terrible (laughs) (laughs) the the cards look as as similar to the box as possible um and i this was from the portland game collective this was their first game they've since put out other games that do look nicer have a little more flair and personality to them but this is also a personal project and so i recognize that right that makes sense at the same time, I wish the rules were a little bit better. I wish they were mm-hmm. a little bit clearer and easier to follow. But I think that there's a really unique game in here that that I can get behind because it just feels different. Yeah, it feels like you're balancing how do how do I keep removing cards from my hands without getting rid of too much too quickly so that then I have to draw a bunch of cards. Yeah, and that's an that's an odd tempo uh, mm-hmm. that the game has that others don't. And I also like the fact that when you when you get to the end of the hand, someone, say, sheds out their cards first, uh, everybody else has to score penalty points, negative points, which isn't always my favorite mechanism, right? But you get to get rid of all cards of one suit, one bridge type from your mm-hmm. hand. 
So you might be holding a, an 11, 12, 13 in orange, knowing, okay, well, the round's about to end, but I can just ditch those, and now I'm only holding, like, a, a number two card. So you're not getting slammed with negative points at the end of each round. Yeah. There's some really good thought behind this. What, what do you? What would you give this score wise? I think giving it score wise, I think I'd give it a seven. Like it's something that I would recommend. Um, I wonder how many times I would pull it out personally, just because there's so many other trick taking games out there. But I, I think that it's got some interesting uniqueness to it, like what you said. For me, so. it's a seven point five. I I do like this one quite a bit. The biggest downside is that. Other groups of people I've played with have not enjoyed it as much as me. Uh, so it does seem like a little bit of a of a finicky game. I think it's uh, maybe the word is Marmite. You know, in that you will play a hand or two of it and say, I greatly dislike this or, ooh, I do like this. There's very little middle ground, it feels like, with people saying like, yeah, that's good. I'll throw it into my regular trick-taking rotation. Maybe it's 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 a little bit more Devices. stark. Yeah. Interesting. So there you go. That's Bridge City Poker. The last game we're talking about today is Gap. This is a game that uh, Z already reviewed, but we just want to be able to give our quick thoughts on it. You know, we had to give our thoughts on this very, very light game. <laughs> it is really light. There's not a lot of rules, but that might be what I like about it. Spoilers! Okay, so Gap, how does it play? You have a hand of cards. There's five different colors of cards. You play one out, and based on the number, if it matches the number of cards that are on the four face up in the middle of the table, you grab all the ones that have the matching number. If it is one away, above or below the number, say if you play a three, if there's a two and or a four out there, you grab those and place them in front of you. And if it matches nothing out there and is adjacent one number next to nothing, you don't keep that card. Someone pointed out that that was a rule that we had played wrong originally mm -hmm. uh, before the review, so that's part of why I wanted to talk I about it. I actually really liked that rule, like adding that in, because I feel like it gives you a little bit more control. Yeah. Because you're waiting, you're trying to get cards in those sets just perfectly. And so if you're like, oh, I think I have it perfectly, then you're trying to save those cards that aren't going to match with anything to get rid of them. It gives you a reason at some point to say, okay, I'm going to play this now. I'm going to play out this two because there's no ones, twos, nor threes. This is the perfect time to get rid of that one mm -hmm. so I won't have an extra purple in front of me. Because initially when I played it, it did just feel like 100% luck. Just like yeah. as stuff came out, if it came out right, cool. But I feel like that adds an interesting bit of decision. Yeah. So the scoring of the game, I think, is what makes this one... I think that's the gimmick that works for me uh, as well, is that you score up your largest column of cards, right? They're different colors. So you score up the number of cards. So I have five red cards, cool. And then you look at which column you have the fewest of two blue cards, where you get five minus two points. You subtract those out. What's really cool, though, is that if you have equal row or columns of cards, so if you have two sets of four, you actually get to add those together. So now suddenly you have eight in your highest minus the two at the bottom. But it also can be inverse, so you could have two sets of three that are your lowest. Suddenly you have six, and you're like, oh, but my high stack's only four. I have minus two points. It's, yeah. it's really funny when someone ends the round with negative points, and I yeah. love that moment. It's, it's just, it is funny. For me, this is so light, and I think that's why I like it. Um, it it reminds me of playing one of those super basic trick-taking games like Hearts, because to me, I don't play them very seriously. They're more of a game that I want to just enjoy the people around me, hang out, chat, and talk, while kind of mindlessly hip reaction-y playing cards. This is, to that point, one of the most conversational games I've played in years. I don't, I, I very seldom have just like conversation during games. Even these other games here, which are you know lighter, enjoyable little card games and stuff, I'm really thinking about the game in Namalia mm -hmm. or even in Chicken Army. We're like making jokes about the game, but I'm not saying like, hey, how's everything been going? How's your day at work today? You yeah. know, what are the kids up to? Stuff like that. This is one of those games where you do just have that opportunity. It's so simple and easygoing to shoot the breeze. You don't really care what other people are doing on their turns Except, like, hmm, the yellow seven's gone. I was going to grab that. Hmm. Yeah, what, the, what card's going to flip over? Can I use it? Can I not use it? Like, there's there's choices. It's not a game that plays itself, but I, I think that it's it's light enough that you can pull it out with those friends that don't play games and don't really like playing games, but they'll play something with you. For your Uno friends, this is better than Uno. And it's quicker, unless you play, for whatever reason, the recommended long game of play to 75 points. No. Don't. 
But I would play to 15. I'd play to 25 or whatever points. Yeah. And that's why I play a few hands out. This is one of those games that's just, it works because of how light it is. But I'm not going to be blanket recommending it to, to everybody. I'm giving this 7. Okay. I'm giving it a 7 because I enjoy it. But obviously if you want a little bit more meat to the bones of your games, I can't say that this is a game that's going to win you over with its lightness. But I think that there's almost... I think almost everybody has situations where they'll want a game that's this easygoing mm -hmm. because they say, oh, let's play something. Let's go, you know, we're out camping. We're out we're somewhere. I, you have a group of teenagers. Yeah, you can play this one with people who aren't really gamers. Right. So I'm going to give this a 7.5. I think it stuck out for me just because of its simplest, like, simple nature. Like, it's just, it stood out. It also stood out because it's so shiny. It's like intensely shiny. shiny. Um, but yeah, I think that it just, it stuck out because it was so simple and clean and very conversational. There you go. That's Gap. That is Gap. Thanks for joining us today for this pile of small box games. Yeah. I hope that you enjoyed this. Trying something different, of course, but uh, a way to highlight, like I said, uh, all these little games. Mm -hmm. Maybe you found something that you uh, are interested in now that you otherwise wouldn't have been able to. Uh, and I really hope that you avoid Fish and Flip. Don't flip those fishes. So Absolutely. anyway, I'm Wendy Yee. And I'm Chris Yee. Have fun fishing for flipped fish. Fish the fish. Flip but them. don't flip the flips. If I learned anything from Zelda, it's that if you put electricity in water, fish die. Yeah, but then you can collect all the fish. Speaking of Zelda, yes. I am now going to go over a complete strategy guide of how to build the best constructs. Step number one.